Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, as opposed to all the speakers who have been before, and I've seen those who are after this, my talk isn't strictly speaking about the people who take part and participate in Operation Nightingale excavations. I was looking for a kind of different angle. And I'm generally in my comfort zone when I'm talking about the remarkable sites which are on the MOD estate. And I can talk and will talk ad nauseum about those kind of, that, that kind of talk. I thought I, I'd like to go out of my comfort zone and go into a kind of more sociological uh, aspect of Operation Nightingale, looking at the organisational model. Um, I am Phil Abramson and I dabble in sociology. I actually do like it and I think it's quite, uh, I, put it, I think it's quite an interesting aspect of the uh, Op Nightingale phenomenon. So bear with me um, because, it, as I say, I'm out of my comfort zone with this particular talk, but I, I still hope it makes sense to you. And if I could get it to work, uh, there we go. I'll get out of the way. Now, my dear old mum used to say to me, Phil, Philip, 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 never ever deconstruct a joke. And I should have listened to her, but this is one exception where I, I, I'm going to make the exception because Larson, to me, is pitch perfect. He takes us on a little journey with this joke. And it, what it is, this fella is climbing up a very high scaffold, and we're all with him, and we all get right to the top of that scaffold, and then we get this, this crazy suicidal urge to jump off. But no, it's brilliant, because he doesn't get a crazy suicide urge, he gets a crazy homicide urge <laughs> to push Frank off. And so what we have here is with Larson, he, he knows that we're making, he makes the assumption, he knows we're making an assumption that we go high up and we go, oh, we're going to jump off, it's terrible. But no, he gets the, the uh, unexpected and undesirable outcome, if you happen to be Frank, that he wants to, to push someone off. So... How does this fit in with Op Nightingale? Well, it is a very tentative link, but I had to get the gag in because I liked it. So, some assumptions about uh, Operation Nightingale. First of all, we expect there to be a great archaeological experience. Let's not forget that. I was just talking earlier uh, with, with Richard and John. Is that if we, when we partake of an archaeological uh, Op Nightingale exercise, we could go to some sites where it's, you know, 50 shades of brown. We're looking at uh, distinction in the colour profile. And yeah, it's great if you happen to be a prehistorian who likes that kind of stuff. But for beginners, uh, for people who are newbies to archaeology, possibly not the best thing. Uh, a good time had by all. Extremely important. We do want people to enjoy themselves. Uh, Improving the well-being of the participants. We've heard about that and we'll hear more shortly in future lectures. And dare I say it, that the reputational enhancement of the people who actually take part, people who take part in Op Nightingales, they feel good about it. It has a feel-good factor attached to the actual initiative. However, there can be undesirable outcomes if things aren't planned. So it could be a site of extremely high complexity, too complex, let's say. We don't understand it in the time that we've got. Uh, the, the, the participants are poorly supervised. And there's no training. And training is a very important part of, of an Op Nightingale. Um, that the people, instead of a good time had by all, people are feeling isolated, perhaps there's some bullying, uh, and a breakdown of the team spirit. Uh, Improves the well-being of participants, that's what we'd like. However, there are incidents of PTSD, there are flashbacks, and there could be inadequate medical supervision. So things could go belly up in that respect. And if the organisations aren't working in harmony, we can get a breakdown in comms, and it can become basically, rather than a good time had by all with reputation enhancement, it becomes a bloody disaster. So we have to set in train mechanisms to prevent that happening and in essence by and large that's the drift of what I'm, I'm going to be talking about and have a look at this sentence for a short while those of us in the the public sector and the civil service it could almost be martian it's 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 very difficult to conceive that when we go to work we we fit in to an organizational structure which allows us to perform to our best uh, and that 
really is the nub of what, what I'm going to be talking about. And evolutionary or organisational management theory, it does have uh, a, quite a history going back to the early part of the 20th century, when Henry Ford had his, um, had his car assembly line, and he had people, one person putting a nut in, another person putting a bolt in, and so on and so forth. And they were looking at what, are the motiv what motivates people to work. It became a bit more refined, if you like, sophisticated in the middle of the 20th century when people started to look at um, environmental factors. These are what motivated people. People are actually motivated not just by money, but they're motivated by conditions of service, attention that is paid to people in the, in the same Hawthorne experiment. And then we come to a more modern management school, systems theory, contingency theory. Deep down, wearing my cynical socialist, when I was a young lad, socialist hat, these are ways really of how do we keep people happy, how do we get them to do as much as possible for as little pay as possible. And I guess that's what organisational theory is. Forgive me, for the, I'm too young to be cynical, I know, but forgive me, that's what I've become. And, and so, the, so, in essence, different type of organisations, and it is, as daft and as obvious as it may seem, but it is the blooming obvious, Different organisations with their different objectives are going to have different organisational structures. So we at MOD, <coughs> I think every one of us has this on the wall, if only so we can recognise the number of stripes or pits on someone to know who we're talking to, what rank they are. And, you know, so the army is a very classical, hierarchical, pyramidical structure. If you were to take another organisation with a somewhat different objective, let's take the university departmental structure, slightly more flattened, so we're going to have the Chancellor at the top, we're going to have heads of departments, and then different departmental sections. So it's not quite the same organisational structure, obviously, because it's got different organisational objectives to, let's say, uh, the armed services. Uh, in archaeology, in the commercial scenario, we have what I would call the three C's of the client, contractor and the curator. And they, in, in a way, they have uh, this, this kind of structure, as, our, as I've said, uh, the client wants to pay as little as possible, where the contractor uh, wants to be as commercially efficient as possible, and I am trying to be polite here, and the curator wants to be uh, as archaeologically effective as possible. Now, if I was any good at uh, uh, PowerPoint, I'd have that flashing red and what an angry, angry look to it. But I'll call that the triangle of tension, because in box standard commercial archaeology, that's the kind of relationship, and it can be an uneasy relationship, actually. And it's not one which we would necessarily want for an Operation Nightingale project. Uh, which brings me to what I've called the axis structure. Now, we're all familiar with the original <laughs> axis. <laughs> the <laughs> axis of evil. There we go, with uh, uh, Hitler, Mussolini, and Hirohito. We're all, we're all familiar with that one, or some of us are of a certain age. Um, the more a modern day version, here was the, uh, was this Regan's or Bush's Axis of Evil. And I know the countries change around and swap according to who's in favour with the Americans and what have you. But that's a more modern day version of the Axis of Evil. But I don't want to go with Axis of Evils because we're talking about an axis of excellence. And I would like to, I would prefer to go with this particular situation. Where, and there's no real uh, parallel between, if you like, the three organisations in my axis as opposed to the, the uh, triangle of tension. But uh, there will be common denominators. When we're working on MOD land, DIO will always be there because we, if you like, we have the land, we're responsible for activities on the land and the we're stewards of the archaeology on the land. And so we ensure the stewardship, we're curators, if you like, of land. And what we, what, what's evolved? What's come, what's come to happen? And I'll be very interested to hear from Dickie and Richard, uh, who, who were up there right at the inception of Op Nightingale, how the system has come. Did it just evolve, or did we stumble into it? I know, earlier on today, we were, I was at lectures about the theory of change, which, which talks about looking at each step and processing each step, and then go on to the next one in order to achieve your goals. I have the kind of the stumbling and bumbling through life theory. In that, by and large, my life and the organisation, like, they just seem to happen. And by and large, if you've got a system that works, why does it work? Generally it works because you're working with good people who share your objectives, have got pretty much the same view of life as yourself, and it kind of works. And that's the kind of situation which I think has evolved 
with Op Nightingale, where we have uh, a veteran recruitment organization, uh, GBH, uh, uh, BGH, <laughs> I always get confused, sorry, G BGH, Breaking Ground Heritage, for instance, is just one, other recruitment available organizations are available, and <laughs> a professional archaeology organization, and DIO. And so what I'll do now is just go through some of the projects where this type of axis of excellence has been, uh, has been uh, initiated. Oh, well, first of all, I'll say, why does it work? Let me just provide the right balance of formality and informality. This is very important, is that when, when our uh, participants are coming on, do they want to see everyone dressed in fatigues? Do they want to see military type of uh, discipline? Uh, no, not really, but they want to see some kind of discipline. They don't want to see kind of anarchy or chaos. They want to, they want to be part of a formal structure, but not too formal. The, it's a flattened chain of command uh, where we can make quick decisions. Uh, we have good communication between us, and that's very important. Literally, on a, on, a, on a nightly basis, sometimes even over a pint, we do actually discuss these kind of things, and what are we going to do tomorrow? Uh, participants are in the thick of it. People feel included in the decision-making process. Very important. And it provides, I feel, a job satisfaction. Everyone participates and leaves the site thinking, a job well done. And in fact, uh, anecdotally, and more so, I remember on one, on one project at Care Web, we had this lad, Lee, Lee James. He came up first day with a face like Black Monday. He, he had been dicked into, he had been told by his recovery unit, you are participating in this archaeological dig. Ooh, but by the two weeks later, he had, a, he had a spring in his step. He loved it. Why? Because he, he, he kind of got it, really, that he's actually taking part for the first time in a long time, in being part and parcel of a project with his mates. And, and it does work. It's anecdotal, and I believe it's empirical evidence to show it as well. So some, some examples of, of sites where we have initiated the axis of X. Uh, I've always shown this. Kenny, this will be the photograph that you'll be known for. And, uh, this is, I believe it was your first day on a dig, uh, where you were digging with a skeleton, found this fantastic uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, drinking vessel or urn uh, peaked too soon, I would say. Not, <laughs> not many, not, not many sites when you come up with that on your first day or thereabouts. But here uh, we have um, DIO, uh, Breaking Ground Heritage, as the re kind of recruitment sergeant, and working with Wessex Archaeology. And this is on Salisbury Plain, a project which uh, Richard initiated and has been going on now for four years, four or five seasons, is it? Ever. Yeah, forever. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Albemarle Barracks, this was initiated by uh, Colonel McCluskey, 5th Med Reg, uh, based at Catterick. And uh, so the people, the actual uh, <coughs> participants were from 5th Med Reg. DIO, again, it was one of our sites, Albemarle Barracks. And this was a, a charitable organisation, War Quest, uh, run by Nick Hodgson. Uh, basically, they received heritage HLF funding to undertake excavations along and on Hadrian's Wall, uh, which coincided nicely with the position of Albemarle Barracks. So we had uh, recruits from, participants from five Medreg, and also uh, students from uh, Newcastle University. Uh, again, this was uh, an interesting project. Uh, our recruits were from Defence uh, Defense Archaeology uh, Group, DAC, and it was at Marne Barracks, up on the A1 near Scotch Corner, and the A1 joint venture run by Dr. Steve Sherlock provided the expertise, if you like, the tools of expertise. And the outcome was, as people might have seen it today uh, in Helen's talk, uh, the outcome was a lovely book, a booklet, produced by the participants on the remarkable archaeology uh, of the site. Incidentally, this was a nice touch, is at that site, it's um, a Roman villa with Anglo-Saxon burials uh, associated with it. Sixty years ago, uh, Dame Professor Rosemary Cramp dug on a right next to it, adjacent to it, there's a building behind there, the old Catholic chaplaincy, and she, uh, when that was first dug, she was called in to investigate this site. We've opened up the site immediately adjacent to it, and we took a chance, we took a risk, and we, we called Rosemary out, and she was delighted to see it. It was a gamble, um, but so she's quite a perfectionist, and she was delighted at the quality and the nature of the work that was being undertaken. Uh, Barry Budden, this again, DIO land, where 
Wessex Archaeology, uh, Chris Wells and Ben Saunders and Brian Lee the Wise have been uh, with, with the people who came and provided the expertise. BGH again working with Scottish Connections because we've, a lot of the, the digs up until recently, correct me if I'm wrong, have really been centred down south or in the kind of middle of the north, but certainly not north of the border. And so this is a fabulous First World War practice trench system, uh, which you can see over there, which we've excavated now for two seasons and uh, expect to do a third season in late, <coughs> summer, late summer of this year. And this was one of the earliest projects that I was involved in, where, again, personnel were provided Defence Archaeology Group, and University of Leicester provided the uh, expertise uh, Prof. Simon James and Vicky Score from ULAS and her team uh, undertook the work. And, the, and A, the quality of the archaeology is exceptional. It's a scheduled monument and it's a high status Roman building, later Roman date. Um, but part of the deal, it's quite good, is that the participants, we thought, well, you know, it's all very well us talking to the participants about archaeology. What can they offer us? And they offered us a good beasting, actually, because what they thought, they would take us to a, a first aid in the field exercise. And we had the remarkable situation of um, the, the participants basically giving us a bad, hard time, uh, giving us war wounds and fixing them, and trying to, uh, try to recover wounded personnel under simulated fire. A uh, marvellous example of, of sort of three-star personnel being beasted by junior ranks. We love it. Um, so, again, a part and parcel of the deal. Why it was also nice, and this was my first instance where, on a project that I'm not nice to I was involved in, where the University of Leicester academics and students met with the participants from the, the veterans. And it was one of those situations where you think, is there going to be some tension here? Is it going to be a case of, I don't know, middle class students? mixing with working class soldiers, and it's going to be all hell breaking loose, they're not going to talk to each other, etc, etc. But it wasn't like that. It was perfection, actually. Why? Largely because I think it was young people just interrelating between each other. And it certainly seemed to work. Uh, the excavation has been completed, and the report has been sent off to, to CADU. And this is a, a, a project with which, again, I'm loosely associated with, and this is an overseas one on Cyprus, and uh, DIO and the Sovereign Base Administration Authority, who ruled the roost really on the, um, on the UK territories on Cyprus, are excavating uh, a basilica, a seventh century basilica, and a lady, a lady for sex school there, from the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus, she's the project director, and she loves working with the Op Nightingale people. And there's uh, George Pass, Sergeant Pass, and uh, Professor uh, uh, Major Major uh, Richardson, Michelle Richardson, they're my contacts on, on this particular day. And again, it's one which a large number of artifacts, as you can imagine, and it works well. In fact, I think that's taken at Main Building last year, and they were the recipients of the prestigious Sanctuary Award for Heritage Projects of last year. So a lady uh, was flown over from Cyprus to come to that. I believe she's very delighted as well. And so, uh, coming towards the end now, my, I, I need this slide from my a colleague, uh, Major Del Tickner. He was a QM at Marne Barracks, and he gave a talk, because he, he'd never been really introduced to archaeology uh, be much before the work at Marne Barracks. And Del sort of felt, when, he, when he'd seen what we were doing, he pulled out of uh, his collection this Maslow theory of hierarchical need. And a thousand years ago, when I was training to be a teacher, I remember looking at this particular triangle of need, and it's, it's very prescriptive. I'm not saying, I don't think it's kind of cutting edge psychology now, but it kind, of, it kind of makes a point. And the point being that right at the bottom of this is that you need to fulfill, that when participants, or when anyone participates in organisation, or in life really, they need, there are basic, very basic needs that need to be fulfilled. Air, water, food, health, hygiene. <coughs> And lumpy pumpy. I know psychologists say they just can't keep away from it. And then finally, and gradually, as you work your way up, <coughs> that you want secure. Uh, there, there are more. There are other needs which need to be fulfilled by higher, higher order activities. Uh, social, the need for being loved, belonging, and inclusion. And all the time I'm saying, you know, does does Op Nightingale fit 
fit the bill here. And yeah, I mean, you know, all our participants, we're all human. We all want to be involved. We all want to have self-esteem. We all want to be part and parcel and the need for creativity. And ultimately, we all want that. I mean, you cannot now, you cannot have an excavation without it. And that's what the most important, but it wasn't actually, I don't think Maslow in 1955 knew what the hell it was, but he would have put it in if he did know, if he knew about Wi-Fi. And so anyway, as a final, a final statement, um, I put this in for no reason other than that it's a cheap image because it's a fantastic image. How on earth did that happen? <laughs> Who knows? But well, all I can say is that it should have stayed on track with the axis of excellence. Thank you very much.